Hi everyone, welcome to 2.5, Making Human Resources Decisions. This is the last video in the Theme 2 series. We've looked at uh, growing the business, 2.1. We've looked at marketing, operations, finance, and then this is the final of our main kind of departments within an organization, human resources. This has four topics. There's a bunch of key terms in here that are worth bearing in mind. And so we'll start with organizational structures. The first thing in looking at an organization structure is we're looking at how an organization basically gives different members of staff different roles within the organization to allow them to kind of work in their most efficient way. Typically, these structures are either what we call tall or flat. So a tall structure is one that has a lot of layers. They have probably quite a narrow span of control, which means each manager is only responsible for a small number of people. The idea behind that meaning it's a little bit easier for them to manage. Um, however, what it typically does mean is because of the more layers, we typically have more managers and obviously managers command high salaries. And so as a result, it can be a little bit more costly. We also have quite a long chain of command. So as you can imagine, you can see from the small like hint of the diagram there, if we've got more layers, it's a bit more difficult to communicate from the top to the bottom. A message has to go through, well, to be honest, right? You just send an email, it's 2024. Um, potentially 2025 when you're watching this, who knows? Um, but you might just send an email now. But in the olden days and in some businesses, you want to kind of pass a message on through through, you know, verbal communication. You could actually find that it kind of gets lost in translation. You might pass it on to one manager. One manager might misinterpret it, and then they might pass it on. But not only that, it can take quite a long time to get a message from, especially in a business that has sort of thousands of employees to get a message from the top to the very bottom can take quite a long time. So that's a tall structure. If a tall structure is one that has many layers, a narrow span of control and a long chain of command, you can probably guess what a flat structure is. A flat structure is the opposite. So we have less layers, but, and probably less managers, but each member of staff will probably be responsible for more people. They'll probably have a wider span of control, people that they're directly responsible for. We will also, though, on the other hand, have a short chain of command. So it does make it a bit easier to communicate. But what it does mean is if, like, for example, a manager is responsible for nine people instead of four people, it's going to be much harder for them to really keep an eye on and manage effectively all nine people. The more people within a certain remit, the more difficult that's going to be. There isn't one that's better than the other. There's just two differences between them. And so it's worth just bearing in mind tall and flat structures. What are the benefits? What are the drawbacks? But the key thing here is if you want to do this really, really well, you want to learn those key terms. Talk about layers of hierarchy. Talk about span of control. Talk about chain of command. And if you understand what they are, you're in a pretty good place. Typically, the bigger a business gets, it either is going to get taller and hire new managers or it's going to get wider and put a lot more strain on their existing managers. The next key term is centralization. So centralization is where all of the decisions are made at the center of an organization. Now, the opposite of this is decentralization, where decisions are spread out across the business. So for example, if we think about a centralized business, you might think about like McDonald's. It doesn't matter which McDonald's you go to in the UK, you should expect the same things, the same menus, the same prices, the same layout. To be honest, you wouldn't really necessarily know the difference between one and another. And that's because all the decisions are made by McDonald's and the store managers really don't make that many decisions at all. They don't get to choose offers. They don't, don't get to choose products. They pretty much just manage the staff. The opposite of this would be a business that's decentralized. So this is a business that has given their branch managers or their store managers or different parts of their business the power to make decisions for themselves. So a good example of this would be Waterstones, the bookshop. They have a... They have a clear decentralized structure, which is a big change from what it used to be, where they let the store managers of the individual stores choose the books that are prevalent in their stores, in their windows. Typically, what that allows them to do is it allows them to change the books on sale depending on the audience that they might have. So, for example, you go to a really wealthy area, you might see a lot more um, books targeted towards them. If you go to an area that has a lot of children in the demographic, you might see more children's books. And so you can look at things like that. If you, for example, have a Waterstones in Suffolk, they're going to have a section on Suffolk history. Let's be honest, if you're in Yorkshire, you're not going to read books about Suffolk history. And so they wouldn't have that section. They might have books about Yorkshire and about the different kind of geography and features of Yorkshire and key buildings within different cities. The key thing is decentralization allows for that customization, but it does potentially reduce consistency between stores. 
Centralization allows for everything to be the same, but that doesn't allow managers to adapt their products for the needs of their local market. So make sure you know what the difference between centralization and decentralization is. Now, in terms of ways of working, if we're thinking about organizational structure, we also need to think about how our staff are split up and how we have different types of staff for different reasons. So for example, the difference between full-time and part-time staff, full-time staff typically work more hours, part-time staff work less hours, perhaps because of other commitments that they might have. We also have the difference between permanent workers and temporary workers. Permanent workers are ones that have a contract that doesn't have an end date. So for example, my contract at my school doesn't have an end date. I'm going to work there until either they sack me or I choose to leave. A temporary contract obviously has a specified end date. So that could be quite often people might get a temporary contract over a, maybe over the Christmas break where businesses need a few more members of staff. Um, or it could be if you are starting a new job and they're going to put you on a temporary contract for the first year. If you do a good job, they might get you a permanent contract after that. We also have this concept of flexible working. Flexible working is really, really important and, and increasingly more prevalent. So things like working from home, things like being able to be flexible with your work hours, things like maybe being a hybrid worker who works at home some of the time and in the office other times, like all of those are examples of flexible working. Flexible working is basically where the workforce can change and there's loads of different ways this could happen. It might be night shift, might be just having a member of staff that's got lots of skills so they can work in multiple parts of an organization so they can change. Flexible working is one of the most important kind of trends in human resources over the last, especially over the last five years, but I think this is something that's been increasing for a long time before that. When it comes to organization structures, we've also got to bear in mind communication and difficulties with communication. Mainly what we're talking about here is that our communication must be clear and accurate. There's a few things we have to avoid though. We have to avoid excessive communication. So for example, I know that... Um, of an example I read in the news of a company that produces tea and they had a print run of packaging for their tea bags and they spent £300,000 on this on this packaging and then they found out just before it was about to ship that all of the packaging was, was wrong, was incorrect. It had the wrong information on. Now, naturally, that's a really, really expensive mistake. I think it cost them something like £30,000 to to reprint the £300,000 worth of tea's packaging. It obviously spent a lot of time doing that, which meant that there was a delay. And the reason behind this was simply that there was an email that got sent to a member of staff who was supposed to check it. And because they get hundreds of emails a day, they just missed that one. So there's a problem with excessive communication where it's actually quite difficult to understand and to remember all of the different messages you've got and identify which ones are important if you get so many different pieces of communication. The other thing that's worth bearing in mind is this concept of jargon or technical language. Jargon just means like specific vocabulary. We talk about loads of jargon in business. There's loads of business jargon, key terms that you need to know. Ironically, the word jargon is technically business jargon. And so if we are using lots of technical language with people who don't maybe understand the technical language, that can, of course, be a barrier to communication as well. And people might not know what we're talking about. So we've talked about the kinds of staff that we might have, the way they work, the structures that we put them in. Of course, in order to do this and arrange these staff, we need to have staff. And so that's where 2.5.2 comes in, effective recruitment. The first part of effective recruitment kind of follows on from our ways of working in that it looks at different members of staff. And in particular, it looks at the different roles and responsibilities that these staff members have. So I've put a few examples on the screen there. We've got the CEO. The CEO is the person at the very top of the business, probably going to get paid the most, but they are ultimately responsible for everything within the company. They will oversee our directors and a director for a company might have, for example, they might have quite a broad range of, of responsibilities. They might have a really specific range of responsibilities. For example, director of marketing, director of human resources, and they might have a specific focus and they typically manage that focus for the entire business, and then they might report to the CEO and the, and the board of direct of, of the board. Um, senior managers, they might be people with quite a lot of responsibility for managing particular areas of a department or managing particular members of staff. They, if the business is big enough, might be helped by supervisors who might have a job to supervise one specific area of a shop, for example, or a specific group of staff. So for example, if you look at Tesco, there might be a supervisor who's in charge of the fridge section, supervisor who's in charge of the clothing section, and a supervisor who's in charge of just making sure everything's going okay in the checkouts. And then towards the bottom of that 
of that list of responsibilities and roles, we've got our shop floor staff. Now, I've put shop floor staff just as an example, but it could be any kind of like member of staff at the at the and that base the customer facing um, level of the business. These are likely to be the people who interact with customers on a regular basis. They probably know more about how the business runs than any other than any other um, responsibility. So it's just worth bearing in mind the different roles and responsibilities that people have. Now, the real point here is looking at how businesses recruit. Now, why is it important to recruit? If we need to know how they do it, we need to know why we should do it first. So why is it important that we get the right members of staff for the right jobs? Well, the first is that we might need to recruit to add more skills. And so that could be, for example, if our business is growing, we need to get someone in who can do all the finances because now we have more complicated finances. It could be that we're expanding and we need more people with new skills if we're, say, for example, launching a website, we need people who can do that for us. It might be that we have like labor turnover that we're trying to get right. If we can get this effectively, then we can hopefully lose less of our members of staff, which means that actually we don't need to recruit as many people in the future. One of the biggest problems with recruitment is when businesses make the wrong decision and then they find that the person they've recruited isn't suitable and then within six months they're trying to do it again. And finally, we might just be increasing our capacity. If our business is growing, we're going to need more members of staff. Having more members of staff allows us to do more, so it increases our capacity. So how do we do it? Well, we've got internal recruitment, which is from looking at our existing staff. And we've got external recruitment, which is where we recruit staff from outside of the organization. Now, there's benefits and drawbacks to each of these. For example, with our internal staff, chances are they probably aren't as experienced in the promotion that we're potentially giving them. And so as a result, with internal staff, we might have to give them quite a lot of training or they might potentially not really you know, know what they're doing in a new role. And we might have to be a bit patient with them where they learn those, those kind of responsibilities. However, if they're internal and where they're part of our existing staff, we know them really, really well. And they know us, they know our procedures, they know what the business is about, more so than someone outside of the business would. They're also potentially cheaper because they already work for us and so we might not have to advertise quite so extensively And but also because they're probably less experienced, we might be able to not pay them quite as much in the beginning. However, if we give someone a promotion from inside the business, then we are going to have to replace them. If someone gets promoted from a team of five into the manager's position, then the team is down to four and we might have to replace them anyway. So we kind of, there's a situation where with internal recruitment, we might eventually have to do external recruitment to get someone else in to replace the, the job that they have left. External recruitment, quite obviously, is from outside of the big business. The big benefit with this is you do get the potential for a lot more new ideas and creative input, especially if you're receiving a new member of staff who has already worked in the industry for a competitor. They might have some ideas for how you could improve your business based on their experiences elsewhere. They probably do have more experience in the role, especially if it's a role they've done somewhere else before. However, we might have to wait a while for them if they've got a notice period with their existing employer. We might have to wait for them to, to, to arrive to us. And also, they might require a bit more cost. It's quite expensive to recruit. It's quite expensive to advertise. We're going to have to put a lot of time into kind of interviewing them to try and get to know them. Because, of course, if we interview someone for three hours and then we give them a really, really important job, we don't know them really. We just know what they've presented in that three hours. And so it could be that actually what they've presented isn't really the proper reflection of what they are like as a member of staff. So when you're going through this process, the recruitment process, as potentially, you know, you guys might be getting part-time jobs in the future, what kind of documents might you expect to see? So we've got four main ones that you'd expect to see when you're seeing a job advert. The first is the application form. So that is obviously where an employee or prospective employee puts down their personal information. They put down their contact details. They might have to explain a little bit about why they want the job in there. Depends on the job, depends on the application. There's two documents that the business would use. These are the job descriptions and the person specifications. The job, this is going to sound really basic. The job description describes the job. Like it is literally a list of the responsibilities and the rules that you would do if you did that job. So that's about the job, not the person. The person specification is about the person. So this is about the kind of person with the right skills and qualities and maybe education and experience that you would want to do the job. So if you're thinking about which one would you write first, you'd need to write the job description first because how do you know what kind of person you need 
unless you know what kind of job you need them to do. So the job description describes the job, the person specification, again, I'm going to make this sound really basic, specifies what kind of person you want. So you would get those three from the business. The business would provide those three. What you would do is you'd fill in the application form and you might attach a CV. So a CV basically is a summary of your achievements and your characteristics and your qualities and your education. So if you've got a CV, you'd have your personal details, your contact details. You would have your qualifications with your most recent first. So you could put down the GCSEs you study in, the A-levels you study, a degree if you've got a degree. You could put down any other qualifications you might have done. You would put down any work experience you've got. And again, most recent and most relevant first. So if you've had three jobs already, you'd put those down. You'd put down like what you did in those jobs. And you'd quite often put down a little bit of a summary of who you are as a character. Like what are your personal traits? What do you think your strengths are? And you would likely add a couple of references at the end. So the references might be a member of staff at your school, like an academic reference that might say nice things about you, hopefully. It could be if you've had a part-time job or a job, it could be your previous employer might give you the reference. So certainly if I was applying for another job, I would likely use some of my academic references being some of my colleagues, maybe my boss at school or something like that. And by handing that CV in, hopefully, and by filling the application form, hopefully they'll feel like you meet the person spec in the job description. And if that's the case, you might get invited for an interview. If you're successful in the interview, you might get the job. So that's kind of the recruitment process. That's 2.5.2. Once you've got a member of staff, we can't just sort of assume that they're going to be perfectly well-skilled. We talked already about how maybe if it's an internal member of staff, they might require a bit of training. So 2.5.3 is all about training and development. So how do businesses train? Well, we've got two main ways of doing it. We can have a look at on-the-job training and off-the-job training. So on-the-job training, you literally learn while doing the job. Much in the same way that you, if you are learning to drive, you learn to drive by driving, that's on-the-job training. The best way to learn that is to actually do it. Now, don't get me wrong, like you can learn a lot from reading a book, but you can't learn how to drive from reading a book. You can't turn up to do your driving test without having actually driven a car. And so this could be if you're working in a supermarket and you need to learn how to use the till, what they might do is they might just get you to use the till, get you to serve someone. Having a supervisor over your shoulder to give you some help, tell you how to use it, kind of show you the buttons and things like that. But the idea here is the big benefit is if you're doing this, you are actually producing output for the business. You're generating the business money while you're training. The downside, of course, is the person who's supervising you isn't. Um, and so this might require a little bit of kind of patience. It might not be, you might not be great at it so far in early days, but over time, you'd hopefully be able to benefit. Off the job training is where you train away from the job. And so this is where you train by maybe going on a course, maybe reading a book, maybe watching a presentation. There are some elements of your training that you won't be able to do on the job. Like for example, I recently at school went through fire marshal training as part of our kind of health and safety. So I'm one of our school's fire marshals, which means that if I'm in my particular area when there's a fire, it's my responsibility to make sure that everyone's kind of left the building and things like that. And as part of that, you go through causes of fire, you go through things like how to use different fire extinguishers. Now, you're going to do that off the job. The job, the training for that is not going to be let's set something on fire and see how you deal with it. That would be that would be mental. And so for a lot of things, off the job training might be the most appropriate. The big benefit of off the job training as well is you're able to get a specialist to potentially help deliver the training. So for example, we had a specialist come in to the school and who was a fire expert and they kind of talked us through the specialist knowledge that maybe none of our members of staff actually would have had. We've also got this concept of informal training. And now informal training, the, the kind of on the job and off the job training, they're pretty formal. They are like probably planned by the business. You also have induction training, which is the training you get when you first join a business. But we also have informal training that comes through advice and guidance that you might get and mentoring as you work within a business. So I've been teaching a long time now. I have certain members of staff at my school and in previous schools that I've considered to be kind of mentors. I've considered them to be people I would go to for advice. Some people that I haven't worked with for a lot of years, I would still kind of go to for advice. And that is still training. That's still me kind of developing as a teacher, as a member of staff, but it's more informal. There's not a training program I'm going through there. That's just me trying to kind of be better and asking people I trust for advice. So that's another element of training that must be remembered. 
Why do we do it? Well, we do it for a whole range of reasons. To add skills, for example, you know, I did a few little bits of training on how to edit videos, which has allowed me to be able to do this. Um, obviously, you do training with all sorts of different things within a school or within any kind of business. It could be that actually we already have skills, but we want to try and develop those skills to make them better. In a lot of businesses, there might be new technology that comes around. We might have to adapt to that new technology and we might require a bit of training to do so. And then the last one is just that actually, if you are being trained, you feel like the business is interested in you getting better and is investing in you. And so it could actually just be a motivational tool that if they are investing in you, you feel like you're getting better, you feel happier that that you're kind of in an environment where your business is trying to make you better and trying to help support you get better. That links really, really nicely to the last topic in theme two, which is motivation. Quite a nice topic to end on, actually. The first thing here is what is motivation? So motivation is the desire to complete an action. And motivation is influenced by a whole range of different things. We're going to look at the importance of motivation and we're going to look at financial and non-financial motivators. So the first thing is the importance of motivation. Well, it keeps our staff happy. And if it keeps our staff happy, then it keeps our staff loyal potentially. If a staff member is really happy with their job, they're less likely to leave. If they don't leave, then we're less likely to have to go through all that expensive recruitment process where there's the risk that we might not get someone better. It also, though, increases our productivity. If you if you don't know what productivity is, watch the 2.3 video where we talk about productivity. If we can motivate our members of staff, they might work a little bit faster. They might work a little bit harder. They might work a little bit more effectively and take a little bit more care. But it also potentially lowers our production costs and our labor costs like per unit, if I am a member of staff who makes, I don't know, creates motorbikes or something like that, if I'm more motivated, I might make them a little bit quicker. And so if I make them quicker, not only am I increasing my productivity, provided I'm doing it at a good enough standard, of course, but the business is potentially spending less on me per hour because they're getting, well, they're spending the most, the same on me, but they're getting more output from it. So in terms of the labor costs per unit, they might be able to make a little bit of a saving there. So motivation is really, really important. There are several different ways to be motivated. Some of these won't work for everyone. Some of these won't be appropriate for every different business. So we'll have a look at the financial and then the non-financial. So we've got a whole range of financial motivations. Wages, first and foremost, like wages and salaries. Anything financial is really called remuneration. Remuneration is just another word for payment to employees. Wages are more likely to be what you would get if you had a part-time job. You might be paid per hour. You might be paid per piece of work. I remember my old paper round, I was paid per newspaper I delivered. Salaries are a little bit different. Salaries are a fixed amount per year, and these are usually given to kind of more career-based jobs. So for example, as a teacher, I have a salary. I have a certain amount of money that I get paid per year. And it, to be honest, it, whether I work 40 hours in a week or 50 hours in a week doesn't make a difference to my salary. I don't get paid more if I work more. The expectation is I get paid a salary each year to do this job, and I'm expected to work until the job's done. There are also bonuses we can potentially earn. So a bonus is a sum of money given to an employee as a reward for meeting a certain target. A fringe benefit is kind of similar to a bonus, but the difference here is that they're not giving you money, but they're giving you something that saves you money. And there's a little distinct difference there between those two. So for example, a company car, by giving you a company car, they're not necessarily giving you money, but they're giving you something that might save you having to spend money of your own. Discounts on products and services is another one, like a free gym membership would be another example. There's a whole range of different things they could potentially give you. Commission is used in certain areas. So in particular, for example, a car salesperson, um, a car salesperson, they might get paid a salary that's maybe a little bit lower, but they can top that up by if they're really good at their job, if they sell more cars, they can potentially earn some commission and earn extra pay based on their sales. And then finally, promotion. Best way to earn more money is to potentially get a promotion. So a higher role with more pay. That can be a big motivator for a member of staff. The idea that potentially they could earn a promotion and potentially earn a bit more money. But we also have to bear in mind that while money is an important motivator, it's not everything. And no one will do a miserable job for loads and loads of money. You need a little bit of both. You need a little bit of non-financial motivation as well. So we've got a few key terms here that are worth going through. These are the main three ones. We're going to look at job rotation. So job rotation is as simple as rotation of tasks, not just doing the same thing every single minute of every single day. Doing that can kind of keep you stimulated. For example, if you work at McDonald's, you might work on the burgers one day, you might work on the drive through the next day, you might work on serving customers or cleaning the next day. But it just means that it doesn't get too boring because you're not doing the same thing over and over and over again. 
Job enrichment is a little bit different because it's not necessarily the variety of tasks that's the focus. Here, it's more about just giving people a little bit more responsibility and maybe a little few more tasks, giving them a little bit of kind of a little bit of power, a little bit of trust can be really, really motivating. If you're, you'd be surprised if someone in a business comes to you and asks you to do something a little bit extra, you can understand why someone might say, well, why would I want to do that? That's more work. But actually, when you're in those situations, you actually want a little bit more responsibility because you want your boss or someone else within your business to feel like you're trustworthy. You want to feel like you're reliable. So giving someone job enrichment can be really, really impactful. And then the last one is autonomy and independence which just means that you've got a bit of power over your work life. So this could be power over, we mentioned flexible working earlier, but it could be like power over your work options in terms of work from home, work in the office, hybrid working, working hours. But that level of kind of control and power over your over your responsibilities and your roles and your job can be really, really motivational. There's loads of really big examples of businesses that do this very effectively. Google's a really good one, a really interesting one to look at because Google... They have such a wide range of fringe benefits in their in their kind of Google complexes that are well worth having a look at. But they also offer a wide range of um, of job enrichment and, and so on. So they offer a wide range of opportunities for people, but also the control. Like you can choose, you can choose when you go to work. You can choose where you go to work. As long as you get the job done, they're not too fussed about how and where you do it. The main thing from their perspective is they want you to be happy because they believe a happy worker is a worker that's going to work hard and reward them with loyalty. So hopefully you're a motivated GCC student. Hopefully you found that video useful. Have a look at um, the other videos in theme two and theme one. Have a look at any resources. There's a Quizlet link in the description. And if you've got any questions about any of the concepts in this video, please do put a question in the comments and I will do my best to answer it. Hopefully you found these useful. Hopefully these will be really good help for your revision. And uh, like I say, if you've got any questions, let me know. Good luck.